It's so great to be here with you guys to talk about the Lord and talk about the call specifically of Abraham, the promise, but also um, the faith that Abraham uh, gets to exhibit. So I, I'm just looking forward to sharing with you guys. But um, if you can, go ahead, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. We are going to talk about, I've been given a topic specifically about Abram, his call, his promise, but also his faith. And let me go ahead and read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. I think that's... uh, Scratching on my beard. Is that a little bit better? (laughs) Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, starting in verse 1, it reads, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered. And the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going towards the Negev. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, what... an example that we have in Abram. But even more, what a great God who calls. Father, I pray that you would bless these young men and women, that they would know you and that they would value and place you in the proper place in their heart. God, because you are the God who calls, you are the God who promises, and Lord, I pray that we would be a people who would exhibit faith by responding, Lord, to your word. God, we thank you. Bless this time, and I pray, fill me with your word to speak, to help see your people built up in Christ. We thank you now, in Jesus' name. Abram's call, you can't have a seat, I'm sorry. (laughs) Abram's call, Abram's promise, and the way that he responded to the Lord. Now, there are several things that I just want to highlight here, and that's number one, is Abram's call. And we see that very clear in verse one. And it says right here that the Lord, now this word Lord We also use his personal name, Yahweh. It is God's personal name. It is a God who makes a covenant. Uh, When we think about covenant, many times we're thinking about a contract, but with God, it's greater than a contract. And the reason why I say that is because a contract, you can get out of a contract, but a covenant is a relationship that God will fulfill. If we were, for instance, look at Genesis chapter 15. If you were to look at Genesis chapter 15, excuse me, chapter 17, 
there is this sense of covenant that God makes with Abram. And so there is this time when God calls Abram and puts him to sleep. And there is a time when Abram, he takes to a pigeon and he cuts it in half. And there's going to be a covenant that's going to be established. And the thing about it is with the covenant, normally one party will have to fulfill his part of the deal. But with Abram, God puts him to sleep. And it is God who walks through the blood, thus establishing a covenant that was unilateral. In other words, it was the faithfulness of God to initiate, to establish a covenant with Abraham. In other words, I am going to fulfill the very thing that I said that I'm going to do. He is the covenant-keeping God. So it is this God, or should I say Yahweh, who says to Abram, go. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And the first part of that call is, is that Abram, he leaves familiar land. He leaves his family. He leaves to a land that God would, will show him. Now, what I want you to note is that Abram was not told about the land. He, was, he must have acted in faith. In other words, he was not told exactly what that land was going to look like. Look like. Simply, God had initiated this uh, call and said, go, and Abram heard, and then he went, not knowing all of the details that God had in plan for him. Now, it's also very important that you understand the context of what's going on with Abram. If we were to look at Genesis 1 through 11, we have the origins and the early history of the universe. In chapter 1 and 2, we see the creation um, by God. In chapter 3, we see the depravity of man. And then what we see in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 7 specifically, is that man's heart was continually evil. And God says that I'm going to wipe out humanity because of the sin that's going on within the land. And so we have the flood in Genesis chapter 7. And then later on in Genesis chapter 11, we have the Tower of Babel. This is when the men or the people were trying to build a name for themselves. They wanted to be great. They wanted to ascend to the place of God. And God said, I'm going to confuse their language. So we have sin that is inundating the land. We have sin that is um, infecting everything and everyone. And so when we see the call, we see one who is called out of all of the evil that's going on in the land. But I also want you to understand that when Abram received the call, it wasn't because Abram was great. It wasn't because he was self-righteous. No, he came out of a pagan land. When I say pagan, I mean a people group who did not believe and trust in the Lord or in Yahweh. They were, op they were in opposition to God. Let me give you an example. Turn your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. And if you recall, in the book of Joshua, Joshua, he is a successor of Moses, and he is going to take the people of Israel into the promised land. And it was Joshua, as they had um, conquered all of the territory, now he is exhorting and encouraging the people who had went into the land. And this is what Joshua says to the Israelites. It says in Joshua chapter 24, verses 1, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord, 
the God of Israel. Long ago, your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. So what we see right here is that the father of Abraham, or the father of Abram, Tahor, he served other gods. This is the context that Abraham is coming out of. And he says right here, look in verse 3. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many, and I gave him Isaac. And so here is God speaking to the Israelites of all that he had did for Abraham calling him out of a pagan land, out of false worship, out of the world, and I brought him into a place and I've given him a promise. So we see the call. God calls Abram, he calls Abraham, he calls him out of a pagan nation and he calls him into a place and Abram responds and he walks, he goes, not even exactly knowing exactly where he was going. That was the call. But then we see the promise in verses 2 through 3. Look at verse 2. He says, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so what we see here is this promise that God gives to Abram. Number one, I will make you a great nation. And what we see, we can see this fulfilled, for instance, look at Genesis chapter 13, verse 16. He says it again, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also shall, shall be counted. He's talking about how he's going to multiply him. Multiple times God is giving this promise to Abram. Look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. And God, he brought Abram outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Again, there is this promise that God has given to Abraham that I am going to multiply your seed, and they are going to be great. They are going to be a lot of men and women, a lot of people who are going to come from your seed, essentially, from your offspring. And it would be Abram who would be renamed to Abraham. Look at Genesis chapter 17. Look at verse 5. And six. And God is speaking here to Abram. He says, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. So again, here is this promise that God is going to multiply him. And he renames him Abraham, which means father of a multitude. Even through Abram's sin, we have Hagar, and God promises Hagar that her son, Ishmael, will be a great nation of kings. And so you start to see the fulfillment of this. And obviously, we understand the fulfillment that is going to take place through Israel and the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel who are going to be the people of God. So not only is he going to make Abram a great nation, but he's also going to bless them. Again, look at verse 2. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. When we talk about blessed, if we were to look at Genesis chapter 13, verse 2, we see that, that Abram was blessed materially. If we were to look at Genesis chapter 21, verse 22, we can also see that he was blessed spiritually. At Genesis chapter 23, verse 6, he was blessed socially, meaning that the people around him, they recognized that he was a blessed man. They recognized that there was a God who was behind him blessing him, and they honored Abram. But not only that, but he said he would give him 
a great name. Again, you see this in verse 2. Not only would I make you a great nation, not only would I bless you, but I am going to make your name great. And here we are, 2023, is still talking about Father Abraham. So I think you would agree that the name of Abraham is a great name. But he's also going to be a blessing to many. Abram blessing those, um, uh, he would be a blessing to many people that would um, um, encompass the earth. If we were to look uh, in Galatians chapter 3, actually, go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And this is how we see the blessing of Abraham. In the scripture, Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. And so what we see with the Apostle Paul is that he is applying the gospel to those who will come to believe in Christ through faith. So many years down the line, he is applying it to you and I. He is applying it 2,000 years ago when Christ came and lived on the earth, died a death that we should have died, lived a life that we never could live, and died and rose again on the third day, conquering death that we would have life in him. That's the blessing of Abraham. And that blessing specifically is talking about the faith that Abraham exhibited. Again, if we were to look at Romans chapter 9, verse 5, when it talks about the Israelites, whose are the fathers, and from him whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is God over all, blessed forever. And it's talking about specifically the Israelites and how the promises were given to them. And it was going to be through them that the seed was going to come, Jesus, who would be a blessing to the rest of the world. Abraham was a blessing, and he was given these promises. But not only was Abraham called, and not only was Abraham given a promise, Abraham had to respond in faith. Look at verse 4. So Abram, he went. He went. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, he went. You see, faith displayed in Abraham's or Abram's obedience. He went. Now, when we talk about faith, faith is hearing the word of God and responding to him in acts of obedience. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As God speaks to us, we respond to him. That's faith. Faith has a substance in that substance, or that object, I should say. That object is God. It is acknowledging that God is Lord. He is master over my life, and I will respond to him in a way that is appropriate. And so Abram, he responds to faith. He hears God say, go. What does he do? He went. He wasn't a young man either. Look again in verse 4. Abraham, Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old. Now, if you recall, there was a young man by the name of Jeremiah. God said, or God called him, and he went. If we were to look in the New Testament, Timothy, who was also considered a young man, he was given a responsibility, a calling from God to pastor and shepherd a church in Ephesus. But what does he do? He responds. It's not the age. So even though you are here and you might be 17, 18, it doesn't matter. If God has called you, you are to respond in faith. And that's what he does. Even at the age of 75. And where does he go? Look at verse 5. 
And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. How far is Canaan? He left Ur, and I know I don't have a map to show you guys, but let me give you an idea. He probably traveled about 1,500 miles because he stops in Egypt. He comes back up. He travels roughly around 1,500 miles. Now, let's think about this for a moment. 1,500 miles on foot. Do you see the difficulty here? All right, let me just give you a, a, a little context. Let's think about 1,000 miles. If we think about Denver, okay, Denver is about 1,200 miles from us. Now, if you drive, it's going to take you about 16 hours. That's nonstop, 16 hours. But if you walk, it's about 369 hours. All right, I asked Google, and it gave me the answer. 369 hours. Let's break that down. How many days is that? That's about 15 days. But that's walking nonstop. Now, put yourself in Abram's sandals. <laughs> he says, now God speaks to Abram and says, I want to take you to a land. Abram doesn't know where he's going. Somewhere as he's walking, he's like, where am I going? You would think. Right? After maybe 20 miles, maybe after 30 miles, maybe after 100 miles, maybe after 200 miles. You get where I'm going with this? And after a while, you're just like, how much further do I have to go? I don't know exactly where I'm going. But yet in faith, he kept walking. I don't know exactly how much time it took him to get there. But in faith, he continued to walk. Abram. Abram who would later be called Abraham, traveled not knowing where he was going. And so because of this, he is also commended as a man of faith in the book of Hebrews. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, it's, known as the whole of faith. But Hebrews chapter 11, looking at verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that, was, that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. He went by faith over 1,500 miles at the age of 75 years old with Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew. He simply went. He followed in faith. And it says here, where, where did he go? Look at verse 6. It says that Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent and Bethel on the west, and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. What's also significant here is that he's given this promise of land, and there are people already occupying the land. The Canaanites, there are many people, they're there. They're occupying the best of the land at that particular time. And so because of that, Abram would journey even further south. He would go to the Negev, which is further south. And eventually he would end up in Egypt. And it was here in verse 7 that Yahweh appeared, or the Lord appears, um, um, appeared and promised the land of Canaan. Again, he's reassuring him. Look at verse 7 again. 
Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So remember, he's walking, and now he's in the land, and it's occupied by Canaanites. And God is looking at Abram, or speaking to Abram, and he says, this is the land I'm going to give you. But also notice that he says, I'm going to give to your offspring. And in verse 8, Abram responds, and he calls upon the name of the Lord. Again, remember the name Lord or Yahweh. That is the covenant-keeping God. He calls upon the Lord. What does this have to do with you? How does this apply to our life? Much in every way. Because if you have your faith, in Christ, you understand that you were also called. If I was to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31, he says, Know your calling, brethren, and not too many wise, not many noble, not many mighty are called, but God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise. And he goes on and he says how Jesus is our wisdom and our sanctification, our righteousness. All that we have from God is wrapped up into Christ. And it wasn't us initiating this relationship with God. Rather, it was this relationship that was initiated with us by God. It was revealed to us by God, chosen by God to have a relationship with the Lord. But God did not just call us for the sake of calling us and just kind of leaving us to the side and say, okay, go figure it out. No, God has called us for a particular purpose. To give glory and honor to the name of the Lord that all will know and say, what's so different about that man and woman right there? Why do they live the way that they live? It is because we are responding by faith to the Lord who called us. But we're also giving promises. Turn your Bible to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, and let's look at t- verses 10 through 14. And Galatians is a, Paul is debating, <laughs> reasoning with the Galatians that you're not justified by works of the law. No, you are justified by faith alone. And so he goes on in verse 10, Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. He says, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not a faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. What is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What were the promises that was given to us? Justification. Righteousness with God meaning that we have a peace with God. We're no longer enemies or in opposition to God. We are justified simply by faith in Jesus who did it all. And not only that, we are given the promise that we have been delivered from the curse of the law. Why? Because Jesus became a curse on our behalf. Again, that we would become the righteousness of God and that we would receive the blessing of Abraham. And not only that, lastly, he says here, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus says, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. And he's speaking specifically of the Holy Spirit who would indwell believers, empowering them to live a life that is holy and pleasing to God. Those are the promises that are given to us. 
We have an inheritance that is incorruptible. We have an inheritance that's going to be eternal. We have a home, a new Jerusalem that we have to look forward to, being with God forever where Jesus will be there. And all sin will be wiped away. And every tear will be wiped. That is the promise that we have with God. And because of the calling that God has over us and because of the promises given to us, we are to respond just like Abraham did in faith. Again, Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What is faith? Faith is hearing God speak and responding to him in acts of obedience Faith is simply doing what God commands of you. You understand? Why is Father Abraham important for us? Because we also want to exhibit, exemplify (laughs) exactly what he did, walking with God in faith, responding to him in faith, and keeping that before our eyes that we would always be pleasing to the Lord. Let me pray. Father, again, we thank you for this time, and I thank you for these dear saints. Lord God, I do pray that they are encouraged because of the faith of Abraham, but I pray even more that they are encouraged because of the call that you give and the promise that you give. And Lord, I pray that because of that, that they would have the motivation, Lord, to do what is pleasing in your sight. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen.